Hey everyone, so this is a re-upload of the London Reel update with CoffeeZilla, which was put up a while ago and was just taken down because of a copyright claim from London Reel. Uh, for that backstory, watch the film that's going out at the same time as this. It's a short update and explains how London Reel are using copyright law pretty cynically to avoid scrutiny. Uh, but I've taken out all of the copyright material from this so that it doesn't get flagged again. Uh, so that it will go up and will give a lot of the backstory. We've also put the original investigation on our website via BitChute, so if you want to see that, go to the website. So I hope this is going to be the last film about the London Real situation. I'd much prefer to be making films about the wider issues raised by it, kind of free speech, censorship, um, but it is such a good story and I feel that it's worth rounding it off. And I thought the best way to do that would be to have a dialogue with CoffeeZilla. So CoffeeZilla is an American YouTuber who's also been following the story. So I'm going to play the whole conversation. And in it, we talked about the recent meltdown on YouTube and how the London Real Army seems to be turning against Brian Rose. I can't imagine a bigger train wreck with your audience because basically he was getting all these questions, all this pressure. And it's like one day he just snapped. He's cursing at his audience, calling them fools. It was insane. It was absolutely insane. I've never seen a meltdown quite like this. And I was just waiting for it to be deleted. And it was up for at least 24 hours. And just to be clear, it was deleted eventually. Yeah. And also the central question of whether the entire fundraising scheme makes any sense at all. It's the it's the funniest thing in the world to me because it makes zero sense. As soon as Brian Rose said that, I was like, OK, your whole thing makes zero sense. You've raised all this money for nothing other than yourself and your own ego about having your own platform. So we're going to record an update to the London Real uh, investigation, London Real situation. I'm joined by uh, CoffeeZilla, who's been doing his own follow ups uh, on the London Real situation. Thank What's you for your having real name, me. CoffeeZilla? <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> Stephen. I'll say Stephen from now on. Um, so I think both of us, we've talked a little bit offline before recording this, and I think both of us feel a little bit torn, um, like we don't want to keep returning to this story, but it's also such a great story. I'd spend a bit of time just kind of unpacking some of the, the wider issues. But we've, we've both been contacted by other people who've got knowledge of the situation. There's lots of stuff that's been going on that I think it's worth unpacking and revealing to people. And also just some of the... It, it's it's an absolutely compelling story just to see it unfolding in real time. Um, just before we kind of get into the details of it, um, where are you at with it at the moment? I'm where you are. I'm sort of tired of this piece, but also I can't stop looking. It's almost like a, a horrible car crash or something like that. Full disclosure, I've wa I was watching London Real before this whole thing happened and I saw his content. It was going in a certain direction and I feel like I felt and a lot of people felt that recently he has completely shifted into a new direction. And there are a lot of questions about, you know, this fundraising he's been doing, how transparent he's been. And yeah, I feel like at this point, I'm so far in that I I have to at least wrap the bow, tie, tie the bow, whatever, before letting this thing go finally. Yeah, I feel similarly. I, I've been trying... I mean, I was primarily interested in it for the wider issues that it put it put out there, free speech, censorship. But the, the weaponization of free speech is just a huge, in, huge thing as well. Like playing the censorship card, playing the free speech card. And for me, I, I feel that those are such powerful cards and such important cards that we've got to be kind of very aware and very careful about kind of how that's used and how that can be abused. And I think just to bring people up to date... There has been something of a backlash, which we'll get to soon, like the audience, his own audience, people who've donated money especially, have kind of been asking some pretty tough questions. And also there's another angle that you're much more familiar with than I am, which is other sort of business practices. He's brought in uh, this five coins to five million with, with um, Tika Takari. Tika Tawari. Right? Tika Tawari. Tika Tawari. And another another business guy and you've you've actually focused really carefully on that in a lot of the other films that you've put out yeah i think it's like a it's it's a massive question a massive problem when you have someone uh you know raising uh, raising all these funds for, in the name of freedom but also collecting all these emails also getting all this attention and saying like i'm the guy that you guys can trust to give you the truth but then you're selling some crypto what i characterize as a scam 
And that becomes all of a sudden a problem. I I think what you said is true, weaponizing freedom of speech, because it's such a powerful motivator. It's, of course, a universal human value. So when you hear, hey, I'm the freedom of speech guy, who's going to say no to that? Right. Like everybody's a freedom of speech guy almost. Uh, so so I think it's important to say that, look, I don't agree with YouTube's, you know, censorship here. I said that from day one of even about David Icke. Day one, I said, you know what? I don't believe with them just taking him down. I think there needs to be a broader discussion. But what's happened is he's weaponized that and turned it into let me fundraise four million dollars because I'm the guy that's going to protect free speech. And that's just simply not the truth. I think this is a sacred value. And it really. um, Yeah, I feel I feel very energized by when when that is is weaponized and then it gets caught up in like we're in, we're in a struggle with the tech platforms a lot of us feel like we're in a struggle with the tech platforms we're worried about being demonetized we're worrying about worrying about we're worried about having some of our stuff taken down so i think we've got to basically clean house we've got to kind of call out the people who are using those really powerful arguments for their own benefits yeah for sure I think the question here is, what's the intention behind the digital freedom platform? I think that's a large question. I mean, whether he's spending the money poorly or not, what are Brian Rose's intentions? Because for a long time, he's been saying, oh, I just care about free speech. I just care about this. I'm being silenced, blah, 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 blah. One thing I brought sort of to light, though, in one of my recent videos is that Brian Rose's channel has never been doing better. He has seized an opportunity and his views went like this. He was like kind of stagnant. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about censorship He's like this in terms of views, in terms of subscribers, in terms of people backing him, in terms of donations, in terms of people for his email list, in terms of his own audience pool within his audience that was already there. All of a sudden, they care a lot more. And so you have to wonder with each thing he's doing, is he doing it because he wants freedom of speech or is he capitalizing on what could be characterized as an extremely lucrative uh, situation? Yeah, yeah. And let's let's recap. I mentioned a few things in that little spiel before, one of which was the the fact that he supposedly raised a million. It's hard to know because the the counter was actually on the London real site. I was skeptical that he actually had. But you you think that he may well have done, which I think is worth unpacking in itself. But also what happened next? Because then there was this stage six or phase six money making thing, which was we need two hundred and fifty thousand a month to keep this thing running. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, going back a little bit because it's all happened so that now if you weren't present for each subsequent stage, you could think, oh, it was always planned out to be for six phases. And this is one of my biggest criticisms of London Real. So it started with phase one. Oh, I'm going to live stream a million people. Then right after he reaches his goal, all of a sudden he introduces phase two and three. He didn't even have four, five and four, five and six yet. That's all came on later. So then he goes, okay, all I'm raising for is now more controversial voices and blockchain. Where he got blockchain from, nobody knows because nobody really understands why it's necessary. It's not. So then he raises that money. Then he goes, okay, well, now I need to raise more money. And the, the logic there was that, okay, David, give me money because really the intention is just to fundraise to the end of our fundraising date. And then I'm shutting it off. The only you know, rationale for putting more and more stretch goals was always, well, we're just going to continue fundraising, continue taking your money until we go to the fundraising date. That was always the plan. That was the whole rationale for creating $900,000 in stretch goals. And then all of a sudden the fundraising ends, he raises over a million dollars. I believe he did. I believe he did. And I'll explain that in a second. But then he all of a sudden moves on without missing a beat, without any kind of explanation. It's okay. Well, now we need running costs. And he hikes up the price to another $3 million over the calendar year. But why I think he actually raised the money? Because it doesn't make sense for him to put, I think the donation fatigue that it creates in your audience when you, if you lied about raising a million dollars is not worth the press of raising a million dollars. Like who wants to raise, who wants to donate to a guy who's already has a million dollars? Like nobody. Um, So I think if anything, if you were to lie about a donation, you would probably under, underrepresent it. But I just generally think I, I don't know one way or the other. I think it just if we just think in terms of rational actors, he probably didn't lie about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth um, digging into that because my sense was that the that he probably didn't raise a million. Uh, I mean, that the counter was on his website. It was hard to verify. There was no verification. 
but you've looked at these kind of tactics before and you fit, you think that people have raised that kind of money doing this kind of thing before. Is that, would that be a fair summary? Oh yeah. If the skepticism is a million dollars is a lot of money, fear not. Uh, because the, the tactics that he's employing here are what I see all the time, uh, among fake gurus. And it's the persuasion tactics that I see all the time among internet marketers and London real actually has been leveling up. I mean, he's been improving his game quite considerably because for a while, you know, he, he didn't name his, his audience all of a sudden when this thing came along, he goes, Oh, you guys are the London real army right now. That's brilliant. It tribalizes your audience. And all of a sudden there's a bad guy because what does an army do? It fights. I jokingly call my my followers the Coffeezilla army as like a, pl- a play on what all these gurus do. But like, seriously, it's a great way to tribalize your audience and go, oh, we're we're standing for something. We're a team. We're together. Right. So he gets his audience together. And then who's the enemy? Well, you have to get an enemy. Oh, it's the big tech platforms who censored me. And we're going to war with the big tech. And it's a bit of a David Goliath story. Let's be real, which is also a super powerful persuasion tactic. Everyone believes in the underdog, right? Everyone will fundraise for the underdog. So then it's poor, poor Brian, censored Brian. He just needs your help. And he's going to go to war. And we're going to be the brave underdogs who are going to win the day and win free speech back. It's this whole message that's so powerful, easily can can raise a million dollars. And in fact, I think it's very evident the fact that he's putting stretch goals beyond that. I think he believes and I think he's probably right if his audience doesn't turn against him, as it kind of is, that he could have raised more. Yeah, let's come to that, because um, that that was the most astonishing thing. I mean, we both saw it on Sunday night. So he initially posted the a community post on YouTube saying um, with, with a link to the kind of statement, come and sign up and declare. And that got really, really bad uh, comments. A lot of really negative comments. I, I took a screenshot before he del- he deleted that post. And then a couple of days later, and then he posted another one, basically, basically criticizing his audience saying uh, losers focus on winners, winners focus on winning, what have you been doing? And that got an even more um, kind of negative response from people who'd, been, who'd actually given him money. And then Brian Rose himself was in the comments arguing with his own audience, basically, and we'll show some of this, basically saying, you didn't donate. I guess you didn't donate. I mean, you've got some of those comments in front of you. What was, what was your favorite? Oh, my gosh. I mean, there's it may be worth reading off a few because they're beautiful. I Like, I can't imagine a bigger train wreck with your audience because basically he was getting all these questions, all this pressure. And it's like one day he just snapped. The weird thing was the whole post was about explaining the London real platform in like a really passive aggressive way. But then in the comment section, any follow up was met with. I don't have to explain myself. So it's like this weird thing of I'm explaining myself, but I don't have to explain myself because you're a loser if you're questioning me. And like the way he went after his audience was insane. Uh, Winners focus on winning. See above. Scammers. And this guy says scammers focus on scamming. And London Real goes, like you? Let me guess. You didn't donate. Here's another one. Number one, ask for money. London Real. Money gets shit done, fool. Let me guess. You're broke. So let's unpack that. He's cursing out his audience, calling them fools that that may have donated may have donated we don't know in this case and then he goes let me guess you're broke so he's belittling his audience he's calling them dumb and then it was insane it was absolutely insane i've never seen a meltdown quite like this and i was just waiting for it to be deleted and it was up for at least 24 hours um this guy says david ike and brian rose are controlled opposition sorry if you don't see it london real you are a controlled idiot sorry if you don't see it and just to be clear, it was deleted eventually. Yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, I think both of us looked at it and I, I was genuinely concerned. I, I was kind of like, wow, this is this is kind of extreme. Um, and then yesterday he brought out another very sort of slickly produced piece that was clearly in response to that. But he obviously didn't mention it. He didn't mention that he'd done anything. He didn't mention any of the arguments, just... Just sort of, I need to be more transparent. Clearly, I have a problem with communicating and I need to do better. I got an unsettled feeling watching that. Extremely unsettled. Because the difference between what he said 
a day ago. And what he said the very next day was so far apart. It seemed like I was watching. I don't know what I'd say, like a chameleon, something changing colors purely based on environmental factors, uh, which made it totally unbelievable. You know, because one second he's calling his audience idiots. And then the next second he's sitting in front of a camera saying, you know what? I was bad at communicating. I want to explain this whole thing to you guys. I want to be open to criticism. It's like, wait, this is not the same person we saw just yesterday. And he didn't address it at all either. Like he deleted it. He won't address it. He won't address the fact that he was belittling his audience, whatever. And so I think it's extremely strange. And like, I think Brian just felt trapped. And I think it shows how much he can sort of put it on, you know, like uh, one second, he totally believes he doesn't need to explain himself. The next second, I really care about you guys and I really want to do better and da, 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 da. Very weird. Yeah. And I think it's worth kind of flagging up some of the other stuff that we, that's kind of happening in the background as well. I mean, I've been sent, so we know that they delete some comments off the YouTube channel. Um, they also have their own internal London Real um, messaging system that is pre-flagging certain certain work keywords and certain topics that you can't post. So that includes like someone someone sent me some screenshots that that includes Daily Motion, that includes Snake Oil. So anyone trying to discuss the stuff internally is not allowed to. So I think this is worth flagging up, um, which is another thing about sort of. Yes, free speech. We can talk about anything, but don't question me. I mean, that's that's really quite astonishing. And then another thing that we found out from quite a few different places is that there was a, a big, uh, a lot of his staff were not happy about him doing the, the David Icke interview. They thought it was not the right interview to do in the current situation. They didn't want, um, they didn't think it was responsible they knew what David Icke was going to be saying when he came on. So a lot of his staff objected to the David Icke interview happening at, at all. And subsequent to that, to that, a lot of them were either sacked or made redundant. Quite quite a large number of London Real staff. He went he went from sort of, what, 14 or 15 staff down to a very, very small number of staff. Uh, that was before any of this fundraising happened. I think something worth highlighting here is that we've had people coming to us from behind the scenes. We haven't talked about this in either of our investigations, but with some knowledge of the London real situation, we've got a much clearer picture of what's going on that do raise inconsistencies, maybe hypocrisies, because while you can make the free speech argument, uh, like you said about David, Icke, I don't even think you have to. I think you can simply point out the fact that Brian Rose wants it both ways. He wants to, on the one hand, say he's all about free speech, free speech, free speech. You can say whatever you want. I fight for free speech. But on the other hand, he also wants to censor comments that are critical of him. Like, how can he want YouTube to not censor anything of his, but he wants to censor his audience himself? He wants to control what goes on his on his digital freedom platform in his own terms of service on the platform that he says is so much for free speech. It says that Long Stem Limited at any point can just remove anything they find objectionable. If that isn't a community guidelines, I've never heard of one before. Like that, it's just community guidelines repurposed for Brian Rose. It, it seems like this. Brian Rose is unhappy with YouTube calling the shots. And so he wanted to make a platform where he called the shots. But that doesn't get a lot of press. Who's going to build Brian Rose his own platform? Well, if all of a sudden you call it the digital freedom platform, you get a lot more traction. And to speak about this uh, this skeleton crew of employees for a second, I think it's worth talking about only in the context of, look, Brian Rose wants to use your fundraising, and I'm talking to the audience here, the people who you know donated to Brian Rose, he wants to use that to, to hire more staff. Look, look at his phase six. It's hire 20 people for digital, blah, 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 blah. He just fired people. Like that hasn't been brought, brought to light at all. After, right after firing people, he's fundraising to hire people. So he's just moving people off his payroll and moving it right onto the audience's payroll. And I think people should be upset about it. I think they have the right to be upset about it because things aren't being transparently uh, communicated here. Yeah. I wanted to also just ask, because something you said yesterday when we, when we chatted before this made a lot of sense, and I don't think it's been spelled out, and that is – just a, ma a major kind of issue with the whole thing, because also in his in his latest message, he said, yes, I use Daily Motion 
um, which was a part of the the initial film that that I put out. Like, actually, he's using daily motion. It's not a it's not a private streaming. But you you actually kind of flagged up that there's no real reason, given that he's already said, look, I'll use free platforms and save your money if I if I can because I'm I'm, I'm caring about how I'm spending your money. There's no real reason for him to be doing any of this because oh, he could I- be using BitChute. It's the it's the funniest thing in the world to me because it makes zero sense. As soon as Brian Rose said that, I was like, okay, your whole thing makes zero sense. You've raised all this money for nothing other than yourself and your own ego about having your own platform. Because listen, guys, listen to me for a second. Okay, think about it this way. What costs all the money? Live streaming. Why not just do like put it on BitChute, right? They're not going to censor you. This thing already exists. You don't have to pay for it. Your your supporters sure don't have to pay for it. Embed it in your platform and then all of a sudden say this, guys, we're not going to do it live. What's so hard about that? Why does he need to do it live? It's not like he's he's a Twitch streamer who reads off donations. It's not like he interacts with the audience. Give me one rationale for why live streaming is so critical when it's the most expensive part. And he says in his little thing, right, I'm extremely frugal. I would never spend your money if I don't have to. But all of a sudden there's this ego trip about it has to go up live. Why? The majority of people who watch content are watching it pre-recorded. Like that's just how it works. It's fine. And also you can pre-record and do a premiere like people do on YouTube, kind of simulate the liveness of it. I mean, I always rag on people for doing pre-recorded webinars and pretending it's live, but this would be the one instance where I would, I would give Brian Rose full permission and I wouldn't rag on him for doing a pre-recorded live webinar if it was to save people millions of dollars in pointless live streaming costs that ultimately, again, what does it serve except for Brian Rose's ego to think about it? Two, two possibilities. One, he builds this digital freedom platform for millions of dollars and you get a live stream. The other is he just embeds it on BitChute where it costs zero dollars. Tell me the difference in actual like practice. If, you, if I don't think Brian Rose can do it. It makes zero sense. Mm. This gets me fired up because this is the whole thing. This is the entire thing is he keeps saying, I'm frugal. I'm doing it for you guys. Da, da, da. We don't have a digital freedom platform. The most egotistical thing I ever heard was we're creating the first ever, ever digital freedom platform. It's not in except in name only like people like BitChute have been doing this forever. There's a bunch of other platforms as well who are freedom of speech like platforms. This is just Brian's yeah. own spinoff and his own egotistical you know ramblings about uh yeah this is the first one ever absolutely not yeah and this is this is a slight segue but it's why so you you go back to a lot of the platform wars um patreon for example um there was a whole thing i think around christmas last year or the year before where patreon kicked off sargon of a card and sam harris left jordan peterson left uh, we left. Uh, Rebel Wisdom left. We 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 now only have to sign up on our website because we're like we don't want to be at the mercy of these big tech platforms just making decisions on who who gets to be who's who's a, a person and who's an unperson. And so a lot of us dealt with these issues back then, or we thought about these questions. And obviously, Jordan Peterson went Peterson went off and created ThinkSpot, the platform. Because if you go and create a platform, you have to wrestle with actual issues, like. If Brian Rose had gone off and said, look, we need to create a digital freedom platform and I'll and I'll align with other people who wanted to do this because we're all worried about this issue, that would have been a completely different dynamic. Because in that but in that dynamic, he would have actually had to face some of the problems that everyone else has had to face when they when they deal with this, which is one, do you allow Nazis on your platform? Like, are you going to have any gatekeeping whatsoever? Who's going to make those decisions? Like we all, you deal with those questions if you actually deal with the problem properly. But he didn't deal with the problem properly. He just basically said, okay, I'll I'll create this thing called a digital freedom platform that's going to be independent of London Real, even though it's not. It's fully owned by him and it's embedded within the London Real website. Can you Um, talk about that for a second? Because I think that's like the weirdest thing that he calls it independent when it's not. um, I think it's worth just playing the clip just to sort, sort of back up that he did definitely declare that was going to be the case. That's the thing that I can't get my head around is why he ever said that if it was always going to be hosted within the London Real website. And I think you mentioned something um, 
that because you you called the cast to find out how much the the stream was going to be or the stream had been for the Ike interview, and they said so you got a figure for that, and it would be sixty one thousand dollars. And you also he he kind of conceded that you also worked out that 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 was a tacit admission. Why, why don't you explain that? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. First of all, let me take a big W on this because everyone in my comment section was saying that I was wrong about how much it cost. And like I, w- I was incorrect because of like some technicality about what they said. I said it was 62,000. The real cost was 61,000 or I might have that flipped. Um, so I was dead on. OK, <laughs> Just let me let me let me hold that real quick. OK, I'm done. Um, but the second thing was about concerning the the rest of the money right because he goes oh no it really did cost a hundred thousand dollars well why if it only cost sixty thousand dollars to live stream let's just recap i think you've 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 said a lot there that maybe if people weren't aware they might not be following oh sure so basically he claimed it was going to be a hundred thousand dollars to stream ike three yes um it was found out a few people found out that it was done through daycast mm-hmm. you called daycast and they said oh hang on um, you said, I want to stream to a million people. How much would that cost? And they said, oh, actually, we've just done that this weekend, and it cost $61,000. That's correct. We just, we just had one of those on, on, uh, on Sunday. That's why I know the pricing off the top of my head. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And so Brian Rose later concedes that point in, in his little update or whatever, but then he quickly follows it up with, hey, well, wait, but we had to upgrade the servers on London Real in order to handle the, 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 the number of – people on the platform. So not only do you have to have live streaming bandwidth, but you also have to have server bandwidth for your actual uh, website itself. But hang on, because that's upgrading London Real, which supposedly should be independent from the Digital Freedom Platform. So again, the Digital Freedom Platform is a completely separate entity. So he spent $60,000 on the Digital Freedom Platform, $40,000 upgrading his personal servers for London Real. So it's not at all. You're just using money that you're Donators gave you that you said wouldn't be used for London Real to upgrade London Real because that's where the digital freedom platform is. And now he's he's spinning some new thing about, oh, no, I had to do that because it was in such a short time frame. Now I'm moving over. But this is one of a one of many things where he's trying to, like, after the fact, spin up new narratives, spin up some new explanation. The whole problem is that the things he's saying turn out to be lies. Him saying that he's going to stop fundraising, he can maybe create a rationale afterwards, but it turned out to be a lie. Him saying that it's an independent thing, that he's not going to spend money from Digital Freedom Platform on London Real, that is a lie. He admitted it in a video anyone can watch right now that he spent at least $40,000 or more on server space and upgrades and whatever for London Real. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And I wanted to to ask about the... The other kind of business practices, because obviously he, as you can see from the, the the social blade stats, there's been a lot of visitors to London Real. Everyone who signed up to the Freedom Platform was given their email address, and uh, the very first emails that people were sent were for what looks to me like kind of get rich quick schemes. With so Tika Tawari, I if you actually check him out, he's. He is no longer licensed as a broker. He was. I, I don't want to get this. I don't want to get this wrong. I want to be very precise with the wording. But you, I know that you like Coffeezilla. What you what you look at a lot is these kind of get rich quick schemes, mm-hmm. the people behind them, and what's going on. So I'd, I'd love your take on 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 all of that. Sure thing. So uh, yeah, to give a little backstory, Tika Tuari is this crypto guru. Um, and he, for a small fee of a few thousand dollars, I believe in this case it was $2,000, uh, you can get his special newsletter where he's going to break down the five coins to $5 million. So five crypto coins and you can make $5 million. If that's not a get rich quick scheme, uh, I defy you to find one, but London real, what he did is he gets all these new followers to his newsletter and then, or his email, uh, list. And he does what is known as renting out your list. So it's basically where you have this new and a lot of people do this and I have a lot of ethical problems with it, but you have some product you're pushing. So you say, hey, Stephen, I want to rent out your list. So you sell it for me. And so I agree. You pay me some sum of money and maybe some back end kickbacks for if people buy your product. And I go and promote you on my email list. Now, the problem is, is if what you're selling is a scam then I'm promoting a scam to my followers and I'm making money off of the scam. 
And so this guy's out here. He's charging thousands of dollars for information that a lot of people think can be found online for free. He's charging thousands of dollars for a newsletter that's run by Agora, one of the largest newsletter manufacturers. And they're constantly pumping out get rich quick schemes. I could show you probably I've like probably a hundred letters from them saying this is the new way to make a million dollars. This is this is the undiscovered thing. And it's their whole business model. Every month, every week, every day, they have some new get rich quick scheme. They get the suckers to fall into it because who buys into get rich quick schemes? Well, it's desperate, poor people. Unfortunately, I wish that wasn't the case Uh, or old people, you know, and and so this is what's happening. So Brian Rose, under the guise of, you know, I have all these new emails, then sells a crypto scam. Well, after he sells it, in, interestingly, he deletes the videos. He deletes the evidence of him promoting that scheme because now he's made his money and he can move on because the event had already happened. But then Wait, let's just stop. Let's just stop there, because sure. I did see I didn't notice that they had been deleted until you pointed it out. But so he sent he sent the email out to to his su- supporters and then had like two or three videos on London Real. It was also, like four or five. It was like four or five. Is a lot with with Tika Tawari pushing this this scheme and then afterwards deleted those videos, which in itself is kind of bizarre thing to do. I mean, he probably claimed that YouTube took them down, maybe, but that wouldn't make any sense because you know there's a bunch of other Tika Tawari videos up. So they're not taking down Tika Tawari videos. Uh, no, Brian took them down. I feel confident saying that. And uh, it's because he got a backlash on it. He'll talk about like freedom and not give transparency right up to the point when he's criticized. And then he will change tact, right? He go he promotes this crypto thing right before he's criticized. Then all of a sudden deletes the videos. He says, oh, you guys are losers. At, or sorry, you're, it, he says, you guys are idiots. Um, you know, you, you can't question me. I don't have to explain this to you. Right up until the point where he gets criticized. Then he turns around and says, no, no, actually, I'm ready to be transparent with you guys. I'm ready to tell you the truth. And to be clear, he's not done promoting these types of things because now he's promoting Tim Sykes, you know, a somewhat infamous penny stocks trader uh, who has some really expensive courses, newsletters, et cetera, as well. Mm. Yeah, it's and I'm also interested to hear a bit more about some of these tactics because they seem very like that. there's real similarities between that and sort of quite kind of culty dynamics like creating in groups, out groups, uh, not accepting criticism, like all of these things. We we actually put out a film with uh, Jamie Wheel where he talked about. I think we called it how to how to spot a cult, and he said, "Well, obviously you've got kind of culty cults which are um, kind of spiritually oriented, but you also get kind of lots of sales tactics, lots of sales techniques are kind of in that same ballpark, and will play with those same same techniques." The silencing of criticism is huge. I cannot. T- First of all, I've been legally threatened um, to, you know, s- stop talking about what I'm talking about uh, because they don't like criticism. I've had students who get sued by the people they take their course because then they speak out and the person doesn't like what they're saying. So they sue them. You know, there's a lot of ways of engineering social proof and engineering the lack of criticism, which is really common among these things. You have to build this unquestioning following, which is very hard to do on the internet, but can be done with the right amount of money for legal uh, to, to basically force people to shut up with the right amount of engineering SEO to make sure your favorable, favorable results go to the top. Right. Uh, so this is super common, which is definitely a cult aspect. Was there anything that we missed out that we were looking to cover? Uh, I think I, I think I have something to talk about. So, David, I want to ask you a question, which is, you know, London Real is in this very precarious situation with his audience. On the one hand, he wants to tell he wants to be transparent enough to where he avoids the criticism that he's not being transparent. On the other hand, there's been clearly things he's been avoiding, like his own terms of service, uh, the spending of money on London Real instead of, you know, the digital freedom platform, you know. Uh, his his unwillingness to move to platforms like BitChute to save all the fees, uh, the likelihood of him being able to win a lawsuit with $250,000. But he's in this kind of careful, balanced, tenuous, tightrope walk. And it seems like the house of cards may be about to fall down. But 
Do you think there's anything he could redeem here? Do you think there's something, some redemption arc that makes sense? Do you think there's an apology that basically needs to be made? Do you think the project needs to be scrapped? If you're Brian Rose, where do you go from here? Mm. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. All the way through this, I've been sort of trying to, yeah, just to make, um, to keep in mind that, that there is a, a, a real person on the end of this and not to get dragged into, because I think I said in one of my last updates, like, the, the pattern that I see Brian doing and many other people doing is what um, Venkatesh Rao has called the Internet of Beefs, which is that the incentive structure of the Internet is driving people more and more towards combat and building armies and getting what, what, what Rao called knights and mooks, which is a brilliant, like it's a brilliant, brilliant article if anyone hasn't read it. Um, and I've never seen a more obvious, transparent example of someone who completely di uh, dispenses with any of the metaphors and just talks about creating an army, just goes all out with the war kind of talk. It's, it's, it's kind of a how-to. Um, so how do you talk about this? How do you pay attention to it without getting drawn into that same dynamic yourself? How do I get drawn into kind of looking at it, making films about it without just feeding that dynamic? And one of them is this sort of, and, and it's the morality tale, like the psychological dimensions and the morality tale of it is also just such a fascinating thing to look at. It's like, what must it be like right now to be in that space? What must it be like to be, to have built what looks to me and to you like a kind of a trap uh, for yourself? Like it, it seems certainly on Sunday and some of the comments of the latest videos, it does seem like, the audience is really starting to turn and because it's one thing to put out a film that people don't like. It's another thing to take lots of money off people and then insult them for asking you questions. Like that's a very different dynamic. Like it's hard enough when you, when, when you put out a, a film that your audience doesn't like it's God knows what it's like where you've actually taken lots of money off them for something. And they're asking, hang on, what happened to my money? What happened to this platform? Um, so, yeah, the psychological dimension of, of – and someone who's been open in the past about having had addiction problems, about having um, – it's like and, – and I think a lot of people feel that they know him. Like that's, that's part of the, the journey with London Real is that people feel that they know who Brian Rose is to some degree. Um, and I think I said in my first film, my sense is there are two Brian Roses. There's the, there's the businessman mentored by Dan Pena – um, who is just this sort of ruthless, shafty grandmother to get ahead kind of American. And then there's also the guy who was honest about his addiction problems and has, like, those two things exist at the same time. I've had more than one person who knows Brian Rose and has known Brian Rose for a while say that that was absolutely accurate. You can almost picture him with, like, the, the better and the worse angels of his nature on both on either side. And... And he's he's been more and more swayed towards sort of the Dan Pena, the multi-level marketing, the uh, just kind of use your gather as many emails as possible and use it to to kind of get as much out of your followers as you can. And that that's been a trajectory. And I don't see a way out that does not involve some kind of mere culpa, some kind of apology. But human psychology is very difficult like to actually do that is extremely difficult and i wonder how i i don't know i and that's part of this as well is like i don't know when when and if something like this comes crashing down what people do and i think realizing that that's yeah, the balance of kind of rights and responsibilities of do I have a responsibility to call this out? I think so. As I said in my first film, I think the whole double bind of freedom of speech is that we have to use it and it becomes a, a, a um, self-correcting process or we're probably going to lose it because the big tech platforms are just going to say we're going to decide um, who's allowed to speak and who isn't. So, 
Yeah, I've kind of wrestled with with this from the beginning of, of like how can you do this in a way that is honest, is authentic, is um, not not seeing someone as an enemy that needs to be attacked, but as someone who is like in some ways there go all of us. Like so, some of the some of the other things that this brings up to me is like the weird incentive structures of alternative media. Sure. Like there, there's lots of these. So basically this whole business model of you have 2 million YouTube subscribers. There's a lot of, there's a lot of places like this now, which have are finding different ways to monetize attention. They have attention through the people they've got on. They get more people to go on because of the old, the other people they've had go on. So that's, the, the, there's a lot of those around. There's a lot of those around and the temptation to like, I mean, rebel wisdom has a, something like that as a business model in that it's a, it's a media channel first and foremost, but we also have to pay the bills. We have memberships, we run online courses. So those, so you can't just say, Oh, the business model is wrong. It's a much more nuanced conversation than that. It's like, how can you know when you're being authentic and when you're, you're not being authentic? Yeah, let and me I jump jump in here real yeah. quick because I think uh, I think it's fair to say that okay, maybe you know if I were in the same shoes, there go I, whatever. Um, but I think at the same time, you have to be aware that what he's done has when you descend into, into the particular, you can see some definitely areas where he just went wrong, where he's talking about head faking his audience. You can't do that to an audience when you're raising a million dollars. You just can't. You can't tell them, hey, I'm having to lie to you about certain things. You can't tell them that you're going to build a digital freedom platform, but then like weeks later say, oh, by the way, I've been using free platforms all along and you should have known that. And then not explain why you're not just using the most obvious free speech platform that there is. You can't say that you're going to stop fundraising and then keep on fundraising under the name of this value that we all hold so dear, but then really not stand up to scrutiny when it's questioned, do you really stand up for that value at all? I think there's some very clear areas where he's gone from, okay, you can monetize an audience. There are ethical ways to monetize attention. Nobody works for free, but that's not what's happening here. That's not why people are upset. People are upset because of the lying, because of the duplicity, because of the hypocrisy, the gigantic gaping hypocrisy surrounding this whole thing. So while we can kind of muse that, uh, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I, all we want. But at the end of the day, we can point to concrete things that concretely has have been the reason for his sort of downfall and the reason that he's in the position that he is. I heard a friend of mine who was talking to about this. I think it really sums up the way a lot of people are feeling right now. He goes, man, it's such a shame what's been going on with London Real because the guy had so many great guests on. He goes, I don't agree with everything the guy said, but he had some really great guests on and he was building a long term reputation that was going to kind of last and build into something sort of greater than what London Real currently is. And that has sort of been traded. I mean, this person that had a pretty decent amount of respect for this person, he's close to a friend of mine, no longer has that respect. He's like, yeah, I won't watch another, like, what am I going to watch the guy who's having all the conspiracy theorists on, who's, you know, sort of lying about the way he's handling this money? No, he's not going to anymore. And I think a lot of people are wrestling with this London reel they had in their mind, like, six weeks ago versus the London reel and the actions of Brian Rose that they see before them today. Nice little rant to end on. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was good. It was good. I think, I think you're right. You're right. I'm, I'm trying to hold all of those perspectives at the same time. I think you're right in, in that. I'm wary of that dynamic of um, unexamined judgment of other people because that comes back and bites you in the ass as well. It sure does, which is why I think it's important to say, and I said it in my video yesterday, but I think we should say here, we have both reached out to Brian Rose on numerous occasions to give him the chance to respond. We have, I've, I've personally emailed him four times, David, how many times do you think you've emailed him? Six. Six times. So between us, 10 times have we reached out to Brian in the effort of getting an examined judgment, in the effort of getting an understood, full 
360 of the situation. It has not been us that is unwilling to come to the table. Unfortunately, it has been Brian Rose for what he may have his own reasons. They might be good reasons, but it's been his decision to leave the people who are criticizing him out of the full picture. And unfortunately, if that creates a skewed perspective at some point, that cannot be placed on our shoulders. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I want you to be my lawyer if, we're, if, if, it ever, if it's ever needed. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I talk a big game, but uh, yeah, it, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun um, kind of going through this. It's been interesting. It's sort of been heartbreaking. I've sort of experienced the gamut of emotions uh, traversing this topic. It's sort of been the longest form series that I've done. And it's been sort of the biggest fall that I've seen. I mean, mm. I don't know if London Real's reputation is as severely wounded as I perceive it to be, but it seems it seems really bad. And it's not something that I relish in. I try not to get too bloodthirsty about these things. But um, yeah, it just is what it is, I guess. Yeah, and it's all your fault. That's right. I'm sure someone will come on. It'll be about the haters, you know, the people, the, the, the criticizers, the malicious forces. Yeah, it's the controlled opposition. They're, they're paying us enough. To, Don't to say down. that even as a joke. Hey, it'd be great if I was getting paid a bunch of money for this. I'm doing it because I love it. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I think that basically covers it, huh? Yeah, that's really good. Stephen, thank you. And let's try and get this out as soon as possible. Pleasure. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.